My name is Dr. Rick Segill. I'm and Ashley. Hey, uh, Jay, how do you This is Kirk to them. And actually, and hey everyone, it's Dr. Rick. And Steve had a question about his migraines. He'd been suffering from migraines for the past two to three days. He's been in bed for about a day. I mean, he is suffering. And he sounded like he was talking with uh, two plugs in his nose, almost completely obstructed. He probably was completely obstructed. But uh, I was going to challenge his diagnosis of taking care of his migraine with, you know, take care of the sinuses first. And then maybe the migraine will go away. So if this is the first time you're finding me, please hit the subscribe button down below if this helped you because it helps the channel. And share this with other people because I can tell you now with uh, bonfires that were burning at the ends of the driveways to tell all the kids to come to trick or treat this way. And then with the fall occurring and the leaves falling and the dogs and cats shedding. And then with the candy that you might have been indulging in and maybe some extra stuff and beer. And then just the plain stress of not being able to sleep and the immune system being bad, everybody's gonna have congestion. And when you have congestion, fine. When you have congestion and it happens to be COVID, you know, a lot of people uh, are going to be thinking, should I get the swab? And wait a minute, no, I'm not gonna get the swab because it can't even fit anything up there. Uh, so, if you think you have COVID, by the way, please get checked out. Call your doctor's office, stop by your local pharmacy or whoever's checking. And that, that way we can at least do contact tracing. Not we, but supposedly the government can do contact tracing and then they can get you to isolate for 10 to 14 days. And then check out my videos on how to take care of COVID. Otherwise, this is Steve's sinuses. He had a CT scan because I asked him, how do you know you have a polyp? Because it sounded like he was told he had a polyp from his primary care doctor. And then his primary care doctor sent him over to an ENT, that's ear, nose, and throat specialist. And they're going to cut the polyp out or do something. But I said, hold your horses there. So let's go through the dynamics and you'll see where I led him to. So this is a sinus CT scan. It's kind of like looking this way at somebody's sinuses, but you just kind of slice the, the head this way and you can see right into the orbits, the brain, the septum. This is the middle septum here. This is the cartilage here and that he probably broke when he was a kid. Now you can always, you can't, it's hard to find a perfect septum that's straight up and down in the middle. Usually it's bent one side or another. And if it's natural, fine. If it's because of trauma, I've got some boxers who have totally collapsed septums and they need fixing because they can't breathe at night. So this is bent over to your left. That's his left, that's his right. So it's bent over to his left. And look here, there are, without going in too much anatomy, those are the orbits. These are the maxillary sinuses right here. Your bone, your skull has to have uh, hollow bones. Otherwise, if these guys were solid, that would put a lot of weight down on your head. So they're hollow. And because they're hollow, they usually have to have a lining of some sort. And the lining is always going to want to secrete something. And it's usually a little bit of mucus to keep things nice and fresh and moist. But the mucus has to go somewhere. So the mucus is supposed to go out the osteo a meatal complex. It's a hole that drains the maxillary sinuses. The frontal sinuses that you can't see up here, the sphenoids behind that, and the ethmoids behind that, but don't worry about that part. But bottom line is that you don't really have solid, massive skulls. You have hollow skulls. Uh, and uh, you can see here, well, you should notice that this is all air, and then this is a little bit of accumulation of swelling, and you can argue that it goes down into, um, it's probably, well, this is part of the skull, but it goes down this way. So the lining up here, not a big deal. Maybe something here, I'm not sure of the what the image is showing, but you should have very thin lining like that. But down here, it's not thin. And it's either swollen, that's why it's like that, or that's fluid. And uh, naturally, fluid is supposed to be there because it keeps things moist, but a lot of fluid, not good. I've seen sinuses that are just opaque. That's a bad infection. Not so bad, but it's slightly more on the right than left. Now, what else do you notice in this? Well, if this is a septum that's supposed to separate the left and the right, there's something here that's not here, if you can notice that. 
So uh, this is swollen. This is not so swollen. And this is where the air passes from the nostrils down, warms up, filters, and goes into the, the, the lungs via the trachea. But if you look here, that's how normal sinuses look. So again, these are the orbits. Those are the frontals that I didn't show you before. These are the maxillaries. So the maxillaries, are, uh, again, lining is supposed to be live. It's supposed to be thin, just thin enough to secrete a little bit, one or two cells in thickness. I believe it's probably one, but just enough to secrete uh, from, I believe, goblet cells or mucus cells to keep the lining moist. And when it accumulates by pressure, by sleeping on one side, sleeping on another side, or just by pressure of blowing the nose, it's supposed to come out and out into the nasal passage and out the nostrils or down the throat. Yeah, you're supposed to swallow it. No harm. But um, so this looks nice. And this happens to be, these are called turbinates. The turbinates, uh, there's three of them, three shelves. So you have turbinate that pops off this way, this way, and this way. Three shelves that increase the surface area of this nasal cavity. So you have a cave. There's an entrance to a cave and there's an exit to a cave and it's just a big cave. And if, um, if the cave had little shelves in it, then you could technically have more surface area within the cave. So you either have a tube or you have a semicircular tube with outpouchings. And that actually increases because of the, the shelves, it increases the surface. And for a living tissue, it's it, for a human being, it's nice because the increased surface area has, you have more surface and you inhale from the entrance of the nostrils to the exit. When you inhale through a big cave, you'll kind of warm the air going through the cave only on the outside. But if you have shelves and increased surface area, there's a lot more contact with the air, air and environment coming in from the nostrils and going down into the lungs. And when you have more surface area full of lining, uh, sorry, full of lining and blood and tiny, tiny hairs, you can actually filter more and you can warm more before it goes down. You can also cause a lot of turbulence so that you can smell. The olfactory nerves are up here. So there's a couple different reasons for those three shelves. It's supposed to be there. I bet I don't know the anatomy of a, of a canine or an animal, but I bet the best predators have a lot of thicker conches or uh, turbinates to, because they want to be able to smell prey from miles away. So that's the normal anatomy with this middle, if it's perfect, middle of the uh, face septum, but we're not all perfect. And this is not perfect. So if you remember, this is, kind of, imagine it's being flipped around, but on Steve's uh, right side, he had swelling. That's what this swelling, that's what his swelling was, the turbinate. So the inferior turbinate, there's three of them, as I said, three shelves, inferior, middle, and superior. The inferior turbinate in Steve on the right side was totally swollen. And when the inferior turbinate on the right side is swollen, it will also block the osteomedial complex, the hole, the pore, and the port. And if it blocks the port, then if there's any, ever any swelling or fluid inside the maxillary sinus, it can't get out because you just close the door. You close the port due to the swelling of the turbinate clamping off the hole. Make sense? So um, he was told he had a polyp. And, and there, I have a picture of a polyp uh, a couple of slides down, but if he had a polyp, that's fine, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. His, the easy answer for the surgeon was cut the polyp out, and that makes sense, or open the hole surgically, and, and that makes sense too. So if you open the hole, stuff will drain out. No more accumulated fluid, no more pressure, because when there's accumulated fluid, when if I was to block this hole off like that, if I block that hole off and this lining continues to make a little bit of mucus, all the time, every hour, every 24 hours, every week, and it has no place to go. It's going to start throbbing, and then eventually you're going to have an infection because it's just a pool of mucus that can't leave. If there's enough pressure inside the maxillary sinus, 
it will overcome the swelling and it'll squeak through a little bit at a time. Probably really painful. Uh, so just for jumping ahead a couple slides, if there's a hole that's open and if there's fluid that's accumulating, you tilt the head this way and it should come out. It should by gravity. So the only problem is, well, we'll get to that in a second. So this is typically the fluid level that you we look for on x-rays or CT scans. And the fluid will accumulate and continue to accumulate if that hole, the osteomedial complex, is not open. So that is a swollen turbinate. Uh, what's this one? No, this, that's a not swollen turbinate, but there's just discharge right here, that yellow. It's yellowish colored. I don't know if you could notice that. And uh, let's move forward. Oh, these are the linings of the maxillary, the ethmoid, and the lining of the nasal passage. So you can see that they're columnar cells, and they have tiny, you can't see it, they have tiny hairs on top of them that hold the mucus. So when you have tiny hairs that hold mucus, and they become sticky so that if there's any air coming through, it captures particulate matter, uh, dirt, dust, dust mites, uh, bad particles from grinding stuff or burning stuff, kicking up leaves, uh, cleaning a dusty drawer or cleaning off your, your desk. Well, all that stuff, you can't, you can't see it unless you see a beam of light in the morning and you see all these particles floating. Well, you inhale that and you would think, eh, I don't feel anything. Well, it doesn't immediately hit you like a boxing hit, but it, over the course of time, causes an allergic reaction because those little tiny hairs, if you can notice them here, that line the entire nasal passage, hairs with the mucus will catch particulates and the particulates will get pulled down, they'll either sneezed out or they get pulled down into a big snot ball until you sneeze that out. But the problem is while it's sitting, touching the, the allergen is sitting there in the mucus, touching the surface of your lining, it can still incite an allergic reaction. So if there is an allergic reaction, you're going to have a reaction to these things. So dust, mite, mold, pollen. To, to start with, there's more out there now. You can put, it's not really an allergy, but you can put COVID and other viruses and bacteria on top of that. But this is what you inhale. And you can see it's, they kind of made it so irritating, right? Irritating, irritating. I mean, that actually gets inhaled, dust mites. You can't see that stuff. Mold too, in case you see it on bread or you go to check if your bread is old and you open the bag and you just got a whiff of an odor. Well, you just inhale a lot of mold. Same thing with a uh, moist or damp basement if you happen to have that. So bad stuff. And um, one of the ways to take care of that in the fall is rinsing. And I have done videos on nasal irrigation with neti pots. That's a neti pot. Yes, it looks gross. You essentially take water, put it in one side, it comes around, cleans the lower turbinates and takes all the crap out. So this is a neti pot and you put it in this side and it comes out the other side and you usually get a packet of saline with it, or not saline, but salt. And you mix it in with your finger. It's supposed to be distilled water, not tap water. And in my other, other videos, I'll show you at the end, I have, I have admitted that I use tap water. And I am taking a chance. I would not suggest that with you guys. There's one case of uh, amoeba, death from amoeba entering the sinus passage from somebody who was irrigating with tap water in Louisiana. I think the CDC found that one case. So they said you shouldn't use tap water. And it, and it kind of makes sense, but I fear that in Louisiana, why you have an amoeba in the water? I mean, it, it, it's too, too bad for the one guy, but that means all the kids are getting amoebiasis. And you don't have to have active uh, diarrhea to have amoebiasis. You can just have a lot of IBS. Anyway, so if you can't get away from the fall and you can't get rid of your pets uh, and you or you do take care of your pets with feeding them high grade meat, and then you give uh, your house a once over with vacuuming uh, using a HEPA filter and you spray and dust all surfaces and you use a, if your furnace will tolerate it, use a high or a, an allergen um, indicated air filter, you might be okay, but you have to go out to your house sometime 
And if you do, and you're highly allergic to the environment, rinse. If you can't stop the exposure, then you at least rinse the hairs free of the stuff that it captured. So the hairs and the mucus capture stuff so it doesn't go into your lungs. That's a pathway into the blood vessels. So if you have it up here and it holds it for a day or two, you can rinse three times a day. I mean, why not? Uh, so uh, I think that's fair. If you don't like this neti pot thing, then you can buy simply saline and just sit, stand over the sink and spray. Up The video I did on um, eustachian tube dysfunction, I believe it's, I'll show you at, at the end, it's on YouTube. Um, but, so take care of the environment and hopefully we'll make it through. But once you make it through the death of most outdoor plants, which is fall, then you have to deal with the mold of winter. So, and then you have to deal with the drastic dryness and cold of winter and heat of winter. Cold outside, dry outside, hot inside, and also dry. And it's not good for your lining. So the lining will go through a shift change and it's going to produce a little bit too much. So important to keep hydrated. So um, the other thing is also to obviously avoid this stuff, but you might want to avoid food. So not all food, but certain allergens. So you don't have to have uh, you, the reaction where you eat and then you blow up and you have, go into anaphylactic shock. You don't have to have that kind of reaction, but you might just have a tiny intolerance. So if you have a tiny intolerance to milk or all dairy, and that means cheese, chocolate, uh, milk by itself, you might want to pull away from that during these times. Because if you have done everything you're supposed to do to control your environmental inhaled allergens and you're still having problems, you can certainly take Zyrtec, but I would try to avoid some of the other common things that you ingest. So you can certainly do your best to avoid the environmental stuff, but you can also do your best to avoid common allergens. And these are the foods that commonly cause a little bit of intolerance to a terrible anaphylactic shock. So I'd say you might want to pull off these for a month or two months and see how you do. Tolerate, get things under control, make it through the change in season and just be into winter and see how, how winter goes. So if I was going to do a withdrawal or elimination diet, in addition to the neti pot rinsing, I'd be very diligent at least until December, like Christmas time. Not much to ask. You can still eat other things, just might want to hold off on these things. So some of these are cool. And even if you're plant-based, you can still do this. If you're carnivore or keto or paleo, you can still try this and substitute other things for the time being, but just to get through the allergens. Otherwise, you're gonna have to go for the medicines. So the, this is a picture of the tiny hairs of the nose. Now you would think, oh, I just cut them. But the, these tiny hairs are almost like these. These are facial hairs and you can't really cut these facial hairs. They're deep inside the nasal passage. You can cut the external ones, but you can't cut the ones on the inside. And they're, so they're supposed to be there. They're there to work as a filter. So if you cut the filter or because you want to look clean, something's not going to get filtered. And you wonder, well, that, is that going to be good? So certainly if it is dis, if it's unsightly, if it, boogers are seen, uh, if it irritates your nose, so fine, cut the externals. But you still have to rinse the internals. So just wanted to show you what the that looks like. And then also in the meantime, like for Steve, while you're watching my video, you can also apply acupressure. So acupressure applied properly, it's an acupuncture point, but you just use your finger with a proper amount of pressure and you'll have to figure that one out on your own. You can apply acupressure to have this blocked up energy flow better. So the Chinese description in tradition, traditional Chinese medicine, the Chinese literature says that when meridias or energy channels are blocked, they manifest as headache. They manifest as sinus congestion. So in theory, if you just take those energy channels and make a move, you'll not have the blockage and you'll not have the symptoms. Makes sense and it does work. But if you're rip roaring deep into a sinus infection, I don't think acupressure will work. I think acupuncture will work better, but you'll have to find an acupuncturist. I'm an acupuncturist. I have Dr. Leon Chen at East West Healing Center in, in Lombard also. I have Dr. Mabel Angel uh, with Angel Acupuncture. 
uh, uh, close by to my old office in Bartlett. That I've done a video. I'll put the link down below. They are great. So give them a try. Also, Janine, who owns Nature's Balance in Crystal Lake, is very good. So these docks are excellent. I'm getting my needles out, and I'm starting to do it now. But it's a shortcut. If you can't get to an acupuncturist, you can try these points. There's three points on your own. Bladder 2, large intestine 20, uh, and stomach 3. So uh, applying pressure to these points should give you some relief. But, I mean, it's not going to hurt. And sometimes what I'll do, there's another point here that's used for nausea. And I will tell some of my patients, you know, if you're in the middle of wilderness and you're nauseous, in sight pain so this point here that's where in martial arts you try to shoot for that with a tiger punch <laughs> i don't know why they say that but it supposedly will knock your victim out in a second but th there is a point here that also wakes you up and it is painful if you put your pen here i was hoping it wasn't open uh so <clears throat> if you hold it there enough and sometimes twirl it It'll make the nausea go away for those of you who are pregnant or just nauseous, you chemotherapy folks. But uh, that's how powerful acupuncture is in traditional Chinese medicine. So sometimes you can do this in the meantime, while you're waiting to rinse, while you're getting rid of the environmental allergens, while you're trying to avoid food, I think it would be great. Now, if uh, you can't get through all that, the or you're really suffering, then you might have to have what Steve's going to go through, which is... Uh, surgery. So endoscopic sinus surgery is what the ear, nose, and throat doctors do. I've seen them work uh, when I was assisting with ENT down at Northwestern University as part of my uh, medical school post training. It was 1988, I think. Uh, I helped the best down at Northwestern. It was awesome. So uh, they used to take this long, rigid scope and put it in there while the patient was asleep and just once they found that there is a narrowing, they would cut old school or drill. That's old school too. Now they can actually insert things that have balloons inserted into the hole and pop it open. Just like uh, having a PCTA uh, or a percutaneous trans uh, something, you know, I forgot what that stood for. It's when you open the coronary arteries up. Well, you can open the heart up, sorry, you can open the nasal passage up as well. And if you theoretically open it with a balloon, it also you can also suck the fluid out, and hopefully the remainder of the fluid will, as it decompresses, stop making so much fluid, and you kill off most of the bacteria that are in there or fungus in there. And the other reason for sucking that out is you can send it off for culture. Um, so let's see. The other thing you can do, aside from opening the hole, is cutting polyps out. So as Steve said, he had a polyp. These are tiny polyps. I do not think people, well, people can have these tiny polyps, but usually when they talk about cutting polyps, they talk about cutting the turbinate out. So that shelf, they just cut the whole damn thing out. And if there's nothing there as far as the shelf, then you go back to that original cave. Perfect. That's great. No more swelling, no more obstruction. But I think you need that surface area for something. So if you have a polyp that's in the way, Cool, you can snip off all the polyps one at a time. But again, my and I liken the polyps to a little punching bag. So if you see a punching bag, it hangs by a swivel. It's large, it hits the bottom, and you just have a big bag. And if you cut the bag off at its stalk, perfect. But you can't do that with a turbinate that's all swollen. You have to take the whole turbinate out. And the problem is, when you take a turbinate out, I think you're going to be missing something that is supposed to be I mean, it was evolved. We were evolved to have turbinates, increase surface area, warm up air, filter out particulate matter. If you don't have a turbinate, what takes its place? I don't know. But these are. This is the swelling of a the nasal passage. It's probably a turbinate, maybe a polyp here and there, fluid. And this is post removal. And that's a wide. That's the cave. This is the cave with the shelves. Wide open, that's cool. I think this post-surgical change, you can see the blood. But if air goes through here, something's going to happen. Because turbinates, and why, the reason they're called turbinates is because they, they cause turbulence to the airflow. If you cause turbulence to the airflow, if there is particulate matter, dangerous irritants in the air that you're inhaling, 
it gets bounced around and it gets stuck somewhere along the line on a hair that's full of mucus. So that's cool. And you also slow down the airflow a little bit. Now, when you don't have any turbulate, turbinates, you have no turbulence and you just have straight air going to the back. So if those of you who have ever worked with an air gun uh, or a fan, you, you can't have the fan blow straight at your face all day long because your eyes get dry. Uh, and also a fan, a, a, a continued airflow to one, one area will cause dryness and, and pain eventually because that is friction. So if you have that going straight, you have a straight cave going straight to the back of the throat, something's going to give. So to sacrifice and breathe better is probably worth it, but I wonder if it changes around the way the olfactory nerves sense smell and the way the filter uh, works to protect the lungs, it probably does. So I would always say, first take care of conservative measures and, and then go for the surgery. But if you're in dire straits, the last thing I want Steve to do is to have the surgery and still have his migraine headaches. So let's talk about conservative measures. The conservative measures are butter burr. I love butter burr. This is not just Butterbur, it's got a couple of different things, but I love the package of Garden of Life. I've been using this, I have a lot of sinus uh, videos and I use this all the time. Three times a day, I bring it out whenever I'm sick, put it back away. I forget how old this thing is, but uh, it comes in uh, blister packs. You can see I started it up again. One capsule three times a day, uh, essentially innocuous. I also have a, also has a probiotic, Saccharomyces, which is a great uh, anti-inflammatory um, yeast that you can take care of. It's not candida, but it's a yeast component that supports the other bacteria in the gut, so it's pretty decent. Uh, I also suggest quercetin, and those of you who are trying to fight uh, COVID or uh, are worried about COVID exposure, quercetin and zinc, fantastic. I have a video on that too. I'll be linking a lot of videos. Um, if you can get a, a physician to send you, the, you know, the Flonase that you'll find over the counter that smells kind of like flowers, it's okay. It's okay before the season, but if you're deep into the shit, I don't think it's going to do anything. I like Atrovent or Ipotropium bromide. Uh, hopefully you saw that and there is no name on this. So, oh, wait a minute. That's not Ipotropium bromide. That's, uh, this is a nasal antihistamine. Azelastin is a nasal antihistamine and it theoretically sprayed on will decrease mast cell response and also gets into the mucosa and systemically works like uh, Claritin or Zyrtec. Sorry about that. So that's, uh, that's a different antihistamine spray that also decreases swelling, which is pretty good. If you have to rely on an antihistamine, do this because it's two for one. After you rinse with the neti pot thing or the if you want to go old school and just sniff from the faucet, which I don't suggest, then after you dry everything out, get all the fluid and the snot out, you spray two sprays of this, or you spray two sprays of Atrovent. This is for people who have severe issues and trying to open up fast. So going to the next thing, which I don't have a sample of, Atrovent is ipotropium bromide, and ipotropium bromide is uh, what we some what I sometimes use for my boxers who have bloody noses. When they have a bloody nose, you spray this on, and it constricts the blood vessels, decreases swelling. Awesome stuff, non-addictive. It's like a non-addictive Afrin. Now, those of you who are on Afrin, do not use Afrin greater than three days. It's very addictive. Not addictive like you'll get the shakes, but the swelling will come back full force uh, sh at a shorter duration of time, and you'll just be using it three times a day, and then it won't work. Then you'll have to be on steroids, steroid pills. So, uh, so antihistamine first, see if it works. Now, if I use this, I'm sensitive to stuff. This will make me sleepy. A Zyrtec doesn't really make me sleepy, but I would rely on Atrovent if I needed it. But if I don't need Atrovent, I go with this. Nasal Crom, the Docker Mill Sodium. This is a mast cell stabilizer. It used to be a prescription, but now it's over the counter. Uh, I can never find this, so I have to order it online. The Docker Mill Sodium, two puffs, essentially no side effects. Um, and you do it two puffs after uh, doing the neti pot three times a day if you have to. And see what happens. I've developed a product with my mixture team mates, and this is essentially saline plus CBD. So CBD is cannabidiol. It's the active ingredient in medical cannabis, but it doesn't give you that psychoactive high. 
it just works to decrease inflammation, stabilize the immune system. So uh, I'm working with my team to use this in a proper way, especially with blending essential oils in this. I'll put a link uh, down below. I haven't done a video on this yet, but I will because it is coming up season. So those are my usual go-tos in addition to what I already mentioned. Now, if you're real old school and you live with a grandma and she happens to be Filipino, she's probably going to want to put this all over your nose. So this is Vicks. It's an evaporative. It's menthol. Menthol, when you put on anything, it evaporates. So it causes a cooling sensation. But uh, I'm sure there are old school other nationalities that use this. I just remember being younger and my mom would take this and just smear it right in my nose on both sides. And if you look at the warning label, it says, do not use on nasal mucosa. So, I mean, in the Philippines, you use it for ankle sprains, skin infection. Uh, if you sinned and you go into church, you put it on your forehead. If you have a stuffy nose, you put it on anything. So uh, it, it isn't going to hurt, but it's just menthol. And uh, you should follow the uh, rules as far as use. So that is my, and then if you still have problems, or if this is truly a migraine, then you need your migraine medicine. But I think it's always worth it to work your way forward. So if it's from caffeine abuse, stop the caffeine. If it's from not getting enough sleep, get more sleep. If it's from the nose being swollen, and we're talking about migraines, then take care of the swelling, take care of the root cause of the nose being swollen. If it's truly from migraines, use your medicine and figure out what's triggering you. Uh, if it's because you have an intracranial bleed, well, you got to see your doctor, get a CT scan and make sure that you're not bleeding into your brain and check your blood pressure. Blood pressure and stress will do it too. So in this time of uh, elections, COVID, uh, unemployment, I think you have to work on calming practice. So those of you who are around the Bartlett area, I am doing a breath exercise routine or breath exercise class on Sunday. I'll put that link down below. There's going to be a lot of links there. But hopefully this helped. If you have any questions or comments on what you use for the allergy-driven issues of uh, winter and fall, uh, I'd like to have you put them in the comments section. Otherwise, don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you at the next video.